Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Crazy Money. This is Paul Ollinger. I've got a great conversation to share with you today about international banking, massive drug cartels, and billions in laundered money. My first guest is Chris Blackhurst. He's the author of a book called Too Big to Jail, Inside HSBC, the Mexican drug cartel and the biggest banking scandal of the century. And if you think about that, we've already had a couple of big banking scandals. So this is a big one. The book tells the story of how HSBC ignored money laundering laws and processed billions in dirty cash for notorious drug lord and murderer El Chapo in the early 2000s and into the 2010s. One of the characters we meet in the book is a guy named Everett Stern, who was an anti-money laundering compliance officer at HSBC. When Everett saw how intentionally lax HSBC's methods for identifying and reporting to the government suspicious activity going on within its banks, he turned whistleblower and uh, started sharing his story with the CIA. Everett has appeared in the Netflix documentary Dirty Money, and he's written a book about his experience called Dark Money and Private Spies. By the way, if you like what we're doing here at Crazy Money, it would be very helpful to us if you would take just a few minutes to rate and review us on whatever podcast app you're listening to. And if you have the opportunity, please do go to YouTube and subscribe to the Crazy Money YouTube channel where you can see full video versions of this podcast. If you're watching it, you can see me twirl my hands. If you're not watching it, you can't. But if you're on YouTube, it's all sight, sound, and motion. So go to YouTube and subscribe to Crazy Money. Let's get into the conversation about HSBC with my first guest, author of Too Big to Jail, Chris Blackhurst. He's the former editor of The Independent and the former city editor of The Evening Standard. He spoke to me from London. Chris Blackhurst, welcome to Crazy Money. Hi, hello. Great to see you. Thanks for doing this. Chris, um, as I mentioned, you're the author of a book called Too Big to Jail, Inside HSBC, The Mexican Drug Cartel, and the Biggest Banking Scandal of the Century. So far, so far. Let's not so far. Put, a, put a button on it. Let's start with the basics. What is money laundering? Oh, heavens. Uh, God, good question. Money laundering is when, you're, um, when you've got the proceeds of crime um, which can be identified as the proceeds of crime, um, and you want to clean the money, get it into the banking system so that it's no longer seen as the proceeds of crime, and as far as everyone else is concerned, it's ordinary clean money. And it's not just clean money, but it's usable money because uh, if yeah. you make your if you make your revenue in increments of one in five dollar bills, uh, th- that gets very very unwieldy to yeah. uh, to carry around, yeah. right? Yeah. So typically in the in the drugs trade, in the in the um, if you're selling drugs on the street, you're going to be paid in a, a as you say in a one dollar or five dollar bills. Um, they're bound to be crumpled, um, <laughs> probably not very nice. Um, they've been around the block several times. And um, if you sell a lot of drugs, you're going to get an awful lot of these dollar bills. Um, uh, and that's what this book is about. Now, how would a bank profit from money laundering? Um, banks profit from money laundering because um, the money comes into their system as. Um, as you and I deposit money, except in their case, they're depositing. In the case of the the drug dealers, uh, drug sellers, they're depositing huge amounts, um, and then it, it they profit in all sorts of ways. I mean, the money is then is in an account. The account is then used to um, do other sorts of transactions, um, opening up the whole bank network, buying bank products. I mean, all the things that banks profit from, from retail consumers, that's how they profit. Take us back in history. Where does HSBC have its uh, its origin and how did it become the bank it is today? Well, the, the clue is in the, in the initials. It's the Hong Kong and Shanghai Banking Corporation. It was set up in the late 19th century in Hong Kong originally. Um, Ironically, um, because of what subsequently happened, um, it got its real kickstart in life um, from the uh, from the trade in opium um, for into, into China. Um, 
So opium was coming from India. Um, it was a huge trade in this business, um, massive, and um, uh, was going into China in return for porcelain, silks, and silver. Um, and um, HSBC's job, um, HSBC's role was effectively financing that trade. Um, it started in um, in the late 19th century. Um, it grew and grew quite quickly and became an international bank, still based primarily in Asia, um, but then moved to Europe. Um, and by the turn of uh, this century, um, was one of the very biggest banks in the world, probably uh, number two or three behind um, behind City and Bank of America. Um, and it, let me just add one more thing: it was famous within banking for following a um, an almost a British Empire type um, type type culture. Um, it, it didn't call its um, uh, its staff weren't called managers; they were called international officers. Um, uh, they were nearly all single men um, until fairly recently, until the early nineteen eighties. In theory, you had to still ask the chairman's permission in order to marry if you were a bloke working for HSBC, and they they called it. They were called tours of duty. Um, they they use the same language really as as the military as the as they did in the British Empire when they were sending people out running various parts of the world and that was the culture that they instilled it, very disciplinarian um, but then as I say in the book that changed. What drove that change? Um, what drove the change very simply was. Um, Ambition, greed, hubris. Uh, I mean, it basically, um, they'd grown the bank to the point where it was uh, it was named as the best-run bank in the world. Um, this is about 2002. Um, and they took a decision, um, they being the board, um, with headquartered in London, to move from Hong Kong to London, um, when uh, Hong Kong went back to China. Um, and they took a decision in 2002-03 that being the best-run bank was great, being a big bank was great, but it wasn't good enough. And they wanted to, they literally took the decision to become the biggest bank in the world. And if you're going to be the biggest bank in the world, then you're going head-to-head -head with Bank of America and Citi. Um, and that's what happened. Um, they were under pressure from, from, um, financial analysts in Wall Street and in London. Um, they were under pressure to keep growing the profits and investors were always wanting more, but they took this decision. And what that, what that meant was that there were parts of the world where they just weren't players. They weren't operating. And one of those was Latin America. Um, and they ended up buying a bank in Mexico, which is really what the book's about. Right. So you can either take your culture and start by building one branch at a time in a new market, or you can go in and grow by acquisition. And uh, what, was, what, were the, what was the banking system like in Mexico when they were considering entering the market? Well, the banking system um, in Mexico uh, is a been through um what's known as the peso crisis um when basically there was a huge amount of politi political instability there was corruption and the currency um had collapsed there were also the drug cartels were were fully at it they were full right here yeah, they were they were operating and mexico um was a i hesitate to say lawless because that's not fair but it it had it, it had major major problems um but it was also a young economy uh and i mean young in terms of the youth of the people um fast growing economy 
and it had got some fairly decent sized banks. But by the time HSBC decided that they were going to go into Mexico um, and use that as a base for Latin America, um, the the better banks had gone. They'd been bought <laughs> by their rivals. So they were left with the fifth biggest bank, which, frankly, very few people outside Mexico had ever heard of, which was called Bital. And Bital operated primarily in the north of Mexico, which, as anyone watching watching us knows, is um, really really the drug country uh, close to the American border. Um, and they they went for this bank. They were warned repeatedly, both internally and externally, that this bank did not really do compliance. Um, but they took the view, and the Mexican authorities told them, but they took the view that um, we're HSBC, we will put our imprint on this bank, we will sort it. And they were so desperate to buy the bank that bizarrely, and it says something about the the loony, the lunacy, the crazy world of bankers, and that, frankly, as well, I mean, you know, this isn't this is a, a serious point that they're nearly all men. They're all driven by testosterone in huge quantities, and um, they called this deal to buy the fifth biggest bank. And I, you know, I stress the fifth biggest wasn't even the biggest. Um, they called it Project High Noon. Um, and that just was crazy. I mean, High Noon, as we all know, was a, you know, a, an old time Western movie starring Gary Cooper. Um, and, uh, they gave it this title, Project High Noon. And that really added to the pressure on everybody involved to get the deal done and get it over the line. And that's what happened. They, they ignored the warnings. They took a very simple view. We're HSBC. We know best. We, we we will sort this out. And um they bought this really, frankly, piece of rubbish, really. But you know, that's that's what they were left with. So when you acquire a bank, you acquire its customers. In addition to all the abuelos and uh, checking accounts of abuelitas, you also get a customer named Joaquin Guzman. Who yeah. is Joaquin Guzman and why is his business a complicated ordeal? Let's be clear. Uh, your your pronunciation, by the way, I can't even begin to do that. But but uh, Mr. Guzman um, uh, did not have a bank account under his own name. Mr. Guzman, he didn't have a checking account that said said J. Guzman uh, Esquire of Sinaloa, <laughs> Sinaloa. Yeah, Mr. Guzman. For those who don't know. Um, goes by the name of El Chapo. Um, he was, uh, what well, still is, um, he, he was and is one of the world's most notorious criminals. Um, he ran the Sinaloa drug cartel, which was the biggest drugs cartel in Mexico, um, the number one supplier of narcotics across the United States. There isn't a, there wasn't a city in the United States that the Sinaloa weren't penetrating, um, repeatedly named by the, uh, by the DEA and CIA as uh, an FBI. I mean, all the agencies were lining up to say that Sinaloa is the most dangerous criminal organization in the world. Um, he was called El Chapo, which means shorty in English. Um, because he's uh he's five foot five foot six inches tall um he is a fearsome individual um he um quickly acquired a reputation he left school i think about fifteen he grew up as a peasant um in northern mexico in the sinaloa the area called sinaloa where um the main cash crop um in theory it's um maize and you know ordinary avocados and beans um in fact the the main cash crop is marijuana um for the united states and um he 
not only showed an incredible ruthlessness where he was prepared to kill himself, um, but he also showed a, a fantastic, and I, you know, give credit where it's due. I mean, it sounds weird. I'm applauding a drugs baron, but an astonishing prowess at yeah. organization and logistics. And he rose up through the ranks of the, um, of the cartel and eventually became the, the boss of the Sinaloa cartel. And his attention to detail, his fastidiousness, his ability to be running. Uh, I mean, if you think about it, we, we always see, a, think of a drugs cartel, um, as, you know, a, a horrible picture, a picture of something horrible of, you know, usually bodies, but of people have been killed in terrible ways. But that's only one aspect. Um, you, you know, they don't make money by doing that. Um, that's normally, there's normally a reason for it. They make their money, um, by selling drugs, by supplying drugs. And, you know, that is a huge exercise, and particularly in the, the level he was operating. I mean, we are not talking about a guy, um, with a couple of cannabis plants. Um, in his loft, this is a guy who was supplying um, tons and tons of marijuana, heroin, crystal meth, you name it, whatever America wanted, Chapo, in, on, in terms of narcotics, Chapo supplied. And often using um, Arctics, um, you know, giant trucks, um, even submarines, Aircraft. He had a fleet of about, I think it was thirteen aircraft at one stage, um, and employing actually thousands of people. Um, I mean, we all think of the the people who carry guns and kill people, but again, they're a small. They're called this the um, sicarios, the killers, but they're a small number. The main body of people are um, the growers, the farmers, the drivers. The smugglers, so a huge exercise, um, and um, tell me if I'm talking too much. What I'd love for you to do is, since you've just described El Chapo so colorfully with uh, the the murderous and efficient operator who 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 is supplying very lethally addictive drugs to the United States of America, let's contrast the head of that business with the head of HSBC. Yeah, one Stephen Green. Yeah, I mean. What this book is about is about um, our obsession as a society with the pursuit of big. And here you had a guy who wanted the his drugs cartel to be the biggest in the world, and you also had a guy running a bank that wanted his bank to be the biggest in the world. And the guy running the bank, rather perversely, um, was a, called Stephen Green, English. Um, uh, worked at, uh, originally worked at McKinsey. Um, but he was, uh, famous in banking for being something quite rare, which is, uh, he's an ordained priest. Um, he, um, espouses, um, um, ethical capitalism, uh, writes books about it or has written books about it. Um, and to the, to the out, to the rest of the world, I mean, there's a, a line in the book saying that his colleagues would notice that he wrote, he wrote his sermons on business flights. Um, so to the, to the world, he was this holier than thou, um, banker. I mean, his nickname in the city was God's banker, mm. um, in London. Um, and that, you know, that there aren't that many, there aren't many people in banking, certainly in those days, and we're talking uh, 20 years ago, um, there were not many people then who were, um, in London anyway, um, very few, who were out Christians. Um, I mean, there were obviously plenty of people who were Christians, who went to church, um, and, and uh, you, you know, were quite quite religious in their beliefs 
but he led but he led with his christianity yes he did um and he was very out there he was out he was always making speeches about capitalism but he also ha- harbored this ambition and his ambition was for hsbc to become the biggest bank in the world and so you've really got the these two contrasts two contrasting figures um but what they both have as well as ambition is um uh they're very good business people um you know they they seriously are they're not um these are two people who've got to the very top in their i don't know if you can call chapos a profession but he's got to the very top green had got to the very top and in parallel they set out to turn their own organizations into the very biggest um chapo had a big big problem um which you've alluded to we alluded to earlier which is he's selling drugs all the way across the united states and we are talking you know the volumes are colossal and um <coughs> he um he's receiving um grubby dollar bills from people that buying drugs on the street and contrary to myth um, and contrary to the film i think it's scarface where they go into a bank with a hold all full of cash you cannot do that in the united states you can try but good luck because if you go into a bank in downtown wherever um you know with a bag a hold all full of cash um the cameras will start whirring and you know, you will be spotted, you will be taken to one side, you will be asked questions galore where this money's come from. So Chapo Chapo had all this money, tons and tons of it. So his solution was to smuggle it back down the same lines that he'd used to get the drugs in. He took it back into Mexico where to his immense satisfaction he discovered and delight he discovered that this funny bank in his area had was now part of a much bigger bank an international network and they weren't pursuing any controls um contrary to what hsbc had told the mexicans um they really took their eye off the ball and they were not bothered um and so he was really literally pushing at an open bank counter. I mean, um, the, the record deposit in one day. And I just ask you and people watching and listening that to imagine this, you're in a bank and the guy in front of you in the queue, um, he deposits 933,000 US dollars in cash. <laughs> now I've, I've got a very short fuse and my wife is always accusing me of being far too impatient and, and, you know, I'm always sighing and tapping my foot. And, um, the idea that this guy is counting out and it was counted out in bundles of $50,000, um, nine, nearly a million dollars. Um, it's just uh, an alarms did not go off. This is the point. This is the difference between HSBC and Mexico and a bank in North America, the United States, the United States, all hell would have broken loose. You go into, let's say, you go into a bank with $933,000 in cash, you're not going to get out of that bank. Um, you're going to be arrested there and then, and you'll be asked to it. So that's what they were doing. So, so once you get in, in into business with the mob, it's hard to get out of business with the mob, right? So... Uh, yeah. I'm a I'm a I'm a bank teller in in the in the Acapulco branch of uh, Bital Bank, which I believe was what the name of the bank they they acquired. And someone, well, they called it they re, they renamed it HSBC. So some so so a guy walks in with fifty thousand dollars in cash. He he makes the suggestion that it's in my best interest to accept this deposit. Yeah. Um, he makes so, a suggestion in a rather crude way, which is they would often. Um, when they got to the counter, they would literally flash up in the palm of their hand a picture of the teller's boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife, their children, 
um, and that was a clear signal. We know who you are. We know where you live. And in Mexico, there's a phrase, you may have heard this phrase, um, it's called the silver or the lead. Um, and the silver is you take the money. The lead is if you don't, you take a bullet. And um, and so the choice facing a lot of these poor bank employees who were terrified, I mean, they, they were in the, they, they knew exactly what they were dealing with and who these people were. But, you know, you have to remember that the, the cartels, particularly in that part of Mexico, are completely endemic. They are so embedded in, and they are te- petrified. Uh, I mean, they've all the, the murder rate was huge, and um, and they would murder freely, just as a warning to others, almost like a marketing tool. And um, so they're petrified. And then the other thing, um, I mean just so we're under no illusion and no one was under any illusion what was happening. Um, Chapo, who's a very resourceful character. I mean, Chapo's whole career is characterized by amazing audacity. Um, he escaped from prison twice. Um, he had a tunnel dug under his cell that was a mile long with air conditioning and railway tracks <laughs> and lighting. I mean, this is a one hell of a guy. And um, he, realized that the whole process of depositing the money was taking too long and it was also risky because people you know if you see a guy uh, a man or a woman walking across the square with a bag and it looks like they've got cash in it well they're a risk so you know they could be robbed themselves so he had made and measured he measured and had made um special pouches or boxes um, that actually fitted directly under the teller's windows um, to speed up the whole process. And the teller, all they had to do effectively was weigh the bag or weigh the box, and then they were on their way. And the whole thing, uh, depositing large amounts, took literally seconds, seconds. Um, And they literally have the chip ready and the receipt and everything and just like that, gone. Um, And then. But even that wasn't enough. Um, it still gave Chapo a headache because by law in Mexico, a Mexican bank account has to be in pesos. And the peso is not, um, it's not an international currency. It's not solid currency. The, the, the currency that everyone wants is the dollar. Um, and Chapo, um, as I said earlier, um, you know, he's running a huge organization. People have to be paid. He's got children to educate. He's got houses to buy. He's got cars. He's got yachts. Um, he had two private zoos, um, with panthers in his, his pride and joy was an albino tiger. Um, sure. um he had to buy aircraft, submarines. So how'd you do that? You pay for them with dollars. Um, you don't pay for them with pesos, you, and you don't pay in cash. Um, you, you know, you, you can't educate your children. You can't turn up at a school with a bag full of cash to pay the school fees. That's not how it works. So, <laughs> and you can't buy a house that way. So, he needed to get his peso accounts into dollars, and HSBC, um, made available i'm not saying they they sat down with chapo and discussed his options but it was obvious as i repeat to everybody what was occurring um they um made available their cayman islands operation and basically you paid the money into an account in mexico it was then transferred immediately to another account in the cayman islands where it's held in dollars and then you're free. Then you, you have access to the entire banking financial world. You can do anything you like with a dollar account from the Cayman Islands. And, um, in, in one year, I think it was, um, 60,000 accounts were opened at HSBC Mexico's Cayman Island branch. There never was a branch. There was never bricks and mortar. Um, there was no front door saying HSBC Mexico, nothing. 
It was all being done on screen in Mexico City. Um, but 60,000 accounts were opened and they held $1.2 billion in cash. And, you know, it doesn't take a genius to think. And by the way, the people owning these accounts all came from addresses in northern Mexico where apparently they, when they were filling out their forms to, you know, what do you do for a living? Most of these people were were literally growing um, melons and avocados in their backyards. Yet somehow they, they were depositing loads of money. I got to get into the melon business uh, if, <laughs> if that's the kind of money it generates. Yeah. So there's a quote you mentioned Scarface earlier, and there's there's a scene in Scarface where uh, Tony Montana, played by Al Pacino, is is meeting with his banker, and 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 Tony is asking for better terms. And the banker replies, we're a legitimate bank. The more cash you give me, the harder it is to rinse. So you can see how this could start on a local level in some Sinaloa branch. But at a certain point, there's no plausible deniability at a corporate level. And since HSBC Mexico had processed $16 billion in U.S. cash deposits in four years, there's a point at which HSBC has to be aware that they have a problem on their hands. Was there someone in compliance sounding the alarms in London? Yeah, uh, repeatedly. Um, um, you mentioned the film Scarface, but actually um, a, a, a film that in a way sums up what, what actually occurred um, was Apocalypse Now, um, Heart of Darkness, where mm. in Apocalypse Now you've got You've got Marlon Brando, Kurtz, um, doing his own thing in the jungle. And, you know, the American military have to bring him to an end. Terminate um, with extreme prejudice. Extreme prejudice, yeah. <laughs> um, but what that's about is a guy who's a long way from the center, who's not being controlled, beyond control. And that's what happened here. The headquarters were in London. While while Chapo was l laundering his money, while they were acting as a massive laundromat for the Sinaloa, the bank was uh, still intent on becoming the biggest bank in the world, and that meant it had to had to be buying things, and they were a lot bigger than Bital. Um, in the in the United States, it bought Household, which was a uh, a huge consumer lending credit card business. Um, you, you know, that from memory, they paid $14 billion for that. Um, they bought banks in Argentina, in Brazil, right across the world. So the management, and they also set up um, uh, or grew their own investment banking operation um, because, you know, you don't get to be the biggest bank in the world if you can't rival J.P. Morgan and um, Goldman Sachs on the investment banking side. So they were doing all this. The amount of activity at the top of HSBC in this period was huge. Um, there were warnings, and they were going up, up, up the pipe, but they only got so far. And um, and then people would say, I'll oh, sort it out. Or, um, But they also went through the classic thing. They went through, um, I think it was, five compliance managers um, covering this area um, in the space of, I think it was 15 months or something. I mean, they, there was a revolving door all the time. Um, people didn't know whether they were coming or going. Um, the local staff, there was, there was a scene in the book where one of the guys in Mexico goes up country and comes back, and he's completely horrified by what he's seen. Um, but they rarely ventured out of Mexico, um, and they were flying in, flying out. They weren't really there permanently. I mean, one of the things that really got under the skin of the Mexican authorities was that um, they didn't bother learning the language. They didn't learn Spanish. Um, they um, uh, there's a I quote a guy in the book who's a very senior bank supervisor from Mexico who was invited to dinner at one of their houses or their apartments. And they made a big show of 
the new apartment and he thought guys i was only i was here only recently when it was being occupied by someone else from your bank this is a serviced apartment you know don't right. kid me don't kid me that you're putting down roots here because you're not and um so all that was going on and the other thing that was happening which, which you've alluded to with the the reference to um, Tony Montana and the bank is that the bank was making enormous profits from Mexico. Um, they they went through the billion dollar revenue mark, which is unheard of for for Mexico. Um, the amount of business that this that one country was generating was was enormous. And the fact that they never really bothered to or perhaps they didn't want to, to explore exactly what what that business, where it was coming from. Um, but on the end of it, they were looking at enormous, fantastic bar charts and charts showing great performance by Mexico. And nobody wants to stop that party. No, and they, they of course, somebody does want to stop the, the party, and they were becoming more and more alarmed, and that was... The, the DEA and the CIA. Boo, par- party killers. No, <laughs> And to be fair, the Mexican authorities, they could all see what was happening. And in the end, they, they, um, the, the CIA, um, DEA, I mean, they all got together and they said enough is enough. Um, my detail in the book, there were, um, three separate um, strands of inquiry were were happening in different agencies. So, in um, in Queens, in New York, there's a a, a great um, classic NYPD um, detective called Frankie Di, Frankie D. Gregorio, who is a is a drug buster. And he busted, him and his team busted a guy in Queens. Um, and as a, and they thought he was a middle ranking dealer. And then they started looking into him a bit more and realized they really caught a, quite a big fish. Um, but all his money was going and was talking his case. It was, I think, several hundred thousand dollars, all going through HSBC. Um, and they started thinking HSBC, H, everywhere they looked, they kept seeing HSBC. That was going on. Um, the second thing was in the, um, in the mountains of West Virginia, um, there was a district attorney called Bill Eilenfeld, who's now a state, um, state senator. Um, he busted a guy on a Medicare fraud. Um, and it was what the guy was doing was pretty crude. Um, and again, the money, his profits were going through HSBC. And this made Eilenfeld think because what he'd uncovered was so basic. And I say so crude that any right minded bank, uh, would have spotted what was occurring. It was just obvious. Um, and so he sought permission to widen his inquiry um, and take a closer look at HSBC. So that was the second. And the third, finally, um, and this is a great story, really, that, that there was a guy called Everett Stern, who is a true hero. Um, Everett Stern applied to join the CIA, didn't get in, and then... Um, and was very upset, very you know, almost heartbroken. Um, wanted to serve his country, um, and answered an ad for somebody to join um, the anti money laundering department of an international bank, and that was HSBC. Um, they were running this anti money laundering program, such as it was out of Delaware. Um, and when he got there, and started work, he was so horrified by what he was seeing that he actually went back to the people who interviewed him for the CIA and told them, you wouldn't believe what I'm seeing. And they said, tell us more. 
And so he became a, effectively a sort of whistleblower. Um, so you have the CIA, the D, I mean, all these different strands. They all, finally all came together. And the, um, Washington took the view that one inquiry is enough. Um, and they took the very firm view, um, having warned HSBC, um, that they might lose their American banking license. Um, that they would, uh, they were going to throw the book at the bank. I actually interviewed Everett Stern, and uh, my interview with him is briefer, and it's going to run on the back end of this interview. He is an interesting guy, and he found that the compliance was a joke, and that they were basically just when 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 alerts would come up, they would just close them, and if he ever tried to raise an issue, his supervisors would call him a troublemaker and tell him yeah, to yeah, you know, just mean, go back, sh- shut up, and do your job. When your job is to close all these reports out and and pretend like we're complying with uh, yeah, a previously I, issued order, right? Yeah, I, I mean, what what he found he, because he was. Um, a serious-minded individual um, with a strong sense of right and wrong, he um, he was shocked and horrified and decided to do something about it. Um, there were other people around him, and this is detailed, where HSBC Solution, having had warnings galore about its lack of money laundering controls, um, its solution was the classic corp- corporate banking solution to anything they just went for size so they literally went out they they moved i think they recruited a, it was definitely 200 and i think in the end it had become 400 um people to to work in this area but these were people who had they weren't really bank employees they had no career structure no career path they weren't people um, who'd been to school and college who wanted to become bankers. Um, they, and so they have no sense of climbing the ladder or anything like that. They were literally, um, uh, fodder. I mean, they were just there to go through the systems and the way it was applied. And this is what you're alluding to with, with Everett was, um, they were effectively being paid or rewarded by quantity how many how many accounts you get through and there was no nothing in it for them to um put the brakes on and set off alarm bells because that held up the process so yeah they were just literally ticking boxes um it was shocking and and it was blatant and yeah i mean it was a uh, in every way, it's this book's really it's about a bank that wanted to be too big, um, a drugs baron who wanted to be big, but it's also almost about everything that can go wrong does go wrong. Yeah, the title of the book is "Too Big to Jail," obviously a reference of to the to the two thousand eight bailout and uh, the "too big to fail" phenomenon, which means the banking system is so intertwined that if it yeah. fails big horrible things happen and that directly informs what happens with the 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 investigations of the united states government yeah um can can you walk us through despite the fact that the government has this ironclad case of just horrific violations of money laundering laws to the tune of tens of billions over years with no deniability in terms of senior executives knowing this is going on. Yeah. Um, and, and yet the course of action that the government takes is, yeah. is not one to pursue any criminal charges. Yeah. So the departments of justice, it finally lands on their door, their desk. They decide in no uncertain terms that they are going to go after HSBC. Um, and the senior bankers, um, they are very conscious um, that no senior banker was jailed over 2008. And this is what, 2000, this is 2012? Yeah, this is 12. So four years previously, just four years previously, the world nearly crashed. Um, right. And no, no banker went to jail. So this is weighing heavily on them. This is actually um, the motivation for going after HSBC. Um, 
they decide they're going to, um, uh, they interview, I mean, they're interviewing people, interrogating them and thing. And then, um, literally right at the very last minute, and it's all in emails, um, where they're talking to each other about bringing a prosecution, getting ready. Um, the British government in the shape of George Osborne, who was then the chancellor. So that's our equivalent of, um, financial secretary. Um, he intervenes. He gets in touch with his opposite numbers in Washington and says to Geithner. them, it says to them, if you prosecute HSBC, um, and its bankers, you run the risk of bringing down the entire bank. You also, therefore, run the risk of bringing down the entire banking system. And this, of course, caused alarm. I mean, you know, great panic within um, departments of justice. And um, the, the, well, the, the, the Brits made another claim which um, was dismissed immediately, which was, you're only doing this because we're not an American bank. Well, that was <laughs> right. That was ruled <laughs> out. That was just you're joking. Get lost. You know, <laughs> you are kidding. Um, but the one about um, bringing down the entire system that that stuck. I mean, I I I, I spent ten years as a financial editor for one of Britain's biggest newspapers, and I covered the 2008 crisis day after day. And I actually took a call from an official in the middle of that crisis who said, um, who accused me of not supporting the government bailouts enough. Um, and he said, I mean, he's swearing. I won't swear, but he swore at me <laughs> and said, do you realize um, if this bank goes down, the whole, effectively, the whole, I mean, put your own swear words in. But do you do you realize if this bank goes down, the whole system goes down, everything collapses? To which I said, where's the proof? Where's the evidence? You're talking rubbish. Um, and that's what happened here. Um, the British government laid it on the line with the Americans um, uh, in Washington, at the Department of Justice, and said, um, you know, if you prosecute, this bank will collapse, um, and the whole of banking will collapse. They didn't offer any evidence, and no evidence was offered for this at all. There was also there, there was also another uh, sticky wicket for the for the UK for the for the uh, Prime Minister's government, right? That uh, he had made Stephen Green, former CEO of yeah. HSBC, while all this skullduggery was going on. He was now a minister in 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 the cabinet, right? In our in our bizarre system we have here, um, Stephen Green has become Lord Green, um, so he's a member of the House of Lords. Our 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 upper house, as you know, in your terms, um, he was made Lord Green and a trade minister um, in the in the same government as George Osborne. And what this led to, which is I detail in the book, is the most bizarre scene, which was uh, very early on, having joined the government, Green organized um, a trade mission to Mexico with the prime minister. So David Cameron went with Stephen Green to Mexico. They met all the Mexican top brass, including the president. Um, they held a party in the president's garden in Mexico City. And both Cameron and Green spoke. Green made a speech about the importance of Mexico um, as a trading center. While he was saying all that, only a few blocks away, investigators were pouring over his bank. Um, I mean, you can't make this stuff up, really. <laughs> this is actually what happened. Um, so, there, yes, there we have it. The, the same government that was pleading the prosecution's not to be brought, was employing a guy who might well have been on the end of one of those prosecutions. So in the end, the U.S. government fines the bank $1.9 billion, much to the frustration of the people who wanted to see justice done. Yeah. No one goes to jail. 
the bank does not admit guilt to a crime, or or do they? Oh no, no, it it does. Um, and what happens is that the the Americans agree that okay, we're not going to we're not going to bring individual prosecutions, but we are going to find the bank. Um, mm. And they find them, as you say, one point nine billion dollars. It's the highest amount in American history. Well, it sounds like it sounds like a lot of money. It sounds like a lot, but this is a bank. This is banking, um, major league banking, and in major league banking, one point nine billion dollars is um, in HSBC's case was five weeks profit. So little, so little that when the fine was announced, the stock went up. Yeah, the stock went right? up. The stock went up. Uh, I mean, you can't, as I say, you can't. Um, it's hard to believe, but it's true. Um, but they also accompanied it with a, with almost a, a rehab program, which was uh, called. It's called a DPA, Deferred Prosecution Agreement. Um, but basically, um, we're not going to prosecute you if you agree to reform your ways and um, go through this. In their case, it was a six-year rehab program of reform. But the point about this is to to agree this deal, to get the deal um, and settlement, um, HSBC did have to admit to what had been going on. And the admission, which um, I'm not sure how many people could be bothered to read it, but I read it, the, the, the admission, to give you an idea, the admission – is 31 pages long um, of all the all the things that they did. So they were all admitted. There's no question that HSBC did these things. Um, it, it, they're admitting guilt um, in return for which they they get hit with a fine. Well, that's nothing, as we've said, and they agree um, this reform program, um, which. They came off the hook for in um, 2019. And has the bank changed its ways? Well, that's uh, the end of the book. Is I detail all the <laughs> some of the money laundering and drug related um, uh, transgressions that the bank's been found guilty of since, including so in December. 2021 so we're only talking a few months ago several months ago um hsbc was fined um by the british authorities this time um 100 million pounds for um lax money laundering controls so there, there are several examples of this i mean um and the answer is i think that they are more aware than they were but Again, I come back to this this thing in our society, this uh, you know, this ideal where we we want everything to be big. Um, so it's big bank, big salary, big house, big yacht, big car, big, 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 and we never really pause and ask ourselves, what does that mean? How do you monitor something so big? I mean, HSBC grew. In the, in the, in, it did, by the way, become the biggest bank in the world. It got number one. But to get to number one, it went from 177,000 employees to 333,000 in about two years. Well, how do you keep a handle on 333,000 people? That's a huge, I mean, that's a city. Um, I mean, it's crazy. Did, um, our ethical business uh, apostle, Lord Stephen Green, and I'm probably getting his title wrong, but did what was his reaction to this? Did he admit any? Did did he acknowledge the banks the the, the banks behavior? Yeah, he um, put out he's put out a statement saying that he very much regrets what happened. The word is regret; it's not sorry. Um, mm. And um, the bank itself. Did um, did issue and has issued apologies, um, but uh, you, you know you have to. Uh, towards the end of the book, I I talk about an American lawyer um, called Richard Elias, 
uh, uh, Rich Elias, who actually worked in the DOJ, Department of Justice, and was so horrified by what he saw um, that they weren't bringing prosecutions that when he actually eventually left the DOJ and went into private practice, he he brought a prosecution, he brought a case on behalf of um, uh, American, American victims of Chapo, of the Sinaloa. Um, and his argument was, uh, this is a case against HSBC, um, and his argument was that the money that was used to um, to pay for the killers, pay for the bullets, pay for the horrible way these people died, that money was laundered through HSBC. Um, and he's got quite a lot of support for this. Um, the problem is that legally, of course, you can't prove that the actual bullet that I used to shoot you, um, that the money went through HSBC. You can't prove that. Um, but nevertheless, he was making a very strong point, and it, I, I make it repeatedly in the book that, it, you know, it's really is time we followed the money. Um, we've been fighting a drugs war. Ronald Reagan started the use the phrase drugs war um actually i think it was richard nixon it was way back way back when um and we're no nearer winning the drugs war either in britain or in the united states or in anywhere else in the in, in the world the drugs war is being lost and um every time we arrest people we arrest dealers and they go to jail by the way so um you know as you know in, in parts of the states three strikes and you're out, um, you get caught three times, mm. you get a big sentence. Um, that doesn't happen to the bankers. Chapo himself, in case you want to know, he's serving life plus 30 years. He's in the um, Supermax in Arizona. I'm not sure what, how you get 30 years on top of your life, but anyway, um, that's, the way, <laughs> that's his sentence. He was also asked to... We'll show you. We'll show you. He was made to forfeit, um, I think it was one point, I can't remember the figure now, is it $12 billion? Um, they're still chasing his money, but we don't, we don't, we don't bring the system to, you know, we don't attack the system. All we do is arrest the wrong people and convict the wrong people. And the drugs business can't work without the banks, and yet the banks don't take any risk because they're too big to fail. They're too intertwined with government and the economy yeah, to I fail. Mean, should but, Stephen should Stephen Green have gone to jail? Well, well, I wouldn't. I won't get into that. I certainly think prosecution should have been brought. Um, the phrase that we is used in regard to this is 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 a moral hazard. Um, mm. The moral hazard is. If I, if you know you're not going to, if you know you're not going to suffer, then you'll behave badly. Um, if you know that you're not going to get caught speeding, you'll, you'll put your foot down in the car. You'll speed. Um, yeah. that's human nature. That's moral hazard. And we're talking about banks here and the bankers know that the thing they fear most, they don't, they're not bothered about a fine. The fine is the cost of doing business. That's how it's built in the accounts, cost of doing business. Nothing. It doesn't hurt them. They're, they still get paid, uh, still keep their jobs. Um, the, um, the one thing that they do not want is to go to jail. If you go to jail, your personal reputation is trashed. Your family suffer. Your wife suffers. People ignore you at the golf and country club. You can't get mm -hmm. the same tickets. Your kids have a hard time at school. They do not want to go to jail. That's the one punishment that they understand, but it's the one that's not used. Well, Chris, this is a really interesting book. I learned a ton about the world and the bank, the bank, sorry, about the world and the banking system and uh, uh, things I was uh, not happy to learn about HSBC, but thank you for all the work you put into that's this. Great. Uh, when does the book come out? When does the book come out in the United States? Uh, it's coming out in the fall in the United States. So it's, I believe it's available for, on Amazon for pre-order now. Yeah, you can um, and it is pre-order away. Um, 
and secure your copy now, but it'll be out in the fall in the United States. And in the UK and Europe, it's available now, right? It's available now. So if you're traveling, you can probably pick it up. Uh, all right. It is called uh, Too Big to Jail Inside HSBC, the Mexican Drug Cartel and the Biggest Banking Scandal of the Century, dot, dot, dot. So far, you can have that one. <laughs> By my guest, Chris Blackhurst. Chris, thank you so much for taking the time. Okay, brilliant. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Everett Stern, welcome to Crazy Money. Hey, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Everett, how did you become an employee of HSBC? <laughs> I think I became an employee of HSBC uh, mainly because I was an idiot, or, they, or at least they, they definitely thought I was an idiot. Um, I, I didn't know anything about money laundering or anything. I remember on the interview, you know, they asked me, you know, do, do you know about money laundering? Do you know about the OFAC sanction? Do you know about this? And I didn't know any of that stuff. And that's what got me hired. And I remember I was a candidate for clandestine service, which is field operations for the CIA before I joined HSBC. And I was rejected from that. And that's what kind of led to me passing information to the CIA you know, later on. But, uh, but anyways, to, to circle back to your question, yeah, I got hired because they, they, uh, they thought I didn't know what I was doing. What role did they hire you into? So I got hired as a anti-money laundering compliance officer. What does that mean you do? Yeah. So basically, like the system of HSBC generates an alert when a rule is broken in the system where, so let's say like you, you want to send $9,999 to person Y, to, 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 to one of your friends, Dave, uh, that, will tr that, that, will, that, that will break a rule. Um, and... I then get that alert and I have to examine that and do due diligence on it and, and make sure that, you know, all the parties are okay and the transaction's okay and it's legitimate and there's no money laundering taking place. Now, why would somebody send a, a wire for $9,999? That seems like an oddly specific amount of money. Yeah. So, so the, the treasury department, um, basically, uh, triggers that like you know the irs um they anything ten thousand dollars or above you have to report to the irs so some people they they call it right underneath the the 10k trigger that that's what they call it in aml terms um and some idiots do it uh and some will do it at eight thousand or just seven thousand you know whatever um yeah um and then there's yeah there's all different types of tactics to try to get around the irs so the idea is we don't want drug dealers walking into a bank with a suitcase full of cash, making a deposit, cleaning that money that came from illicit sales of whatever on the streets and turning it into legitimate deposits in some bank somewhere. Well, you and I don't want that, but HSBC <laughs> certainly wants it. <laughs> so, um, yeah, but, but overall. Why had HSBC set up that department? Well, so when I started, there were only maybe 10 compliance officers in the, in the whole uh, department. There, there weren't many. But what happened was the, the government put uh, this, this OFAC sanction um, on them and said, look, you better clean up your act or we're going to you know, fine the living hell out of you or shut you down. And that's why HSBC built up this giant department to be able to clear all these alerts. There's a huge backlog of, of AML alerts. And... Um, but but basically, they created a false um, system to deceive the government that they were clearing all these transactions and that they were trying to create an AML program, an anti-money laundering program, when, when in fact, um, what they were trying to do was help terrorists and drug cartels receive the money that, that they needed. So, the, you know, HSBC was, was very much, uh, you know... Uh, and so I, I still believe, you know, is, is, is an enemy of the United States. I mean, they were they were actively trying. You know, this wasn't like a criminal negligence thing where, where they were accidentally sending money to drug cartels or to, you know, terrorist organizations. I mean, I saw money going to Hezbollah where that money was being used to create the IEDs to blow up our troops. 
and, and it was intentionally being done. Um, that much I'll say. So this anti uh, the, the anti money money laundering compliance department was really just a, a formality, was performative, and you were just going through the motions to demonstrate to the U.S. government that you that, that the bank was actually doing something, but you weren't doing anything, were you? No, no, no. So, so if we give you a great example. I mean that department, not not you individually. You were trying to do something. C- correct. I was trying to do something, but but so let me give you an example. So, like for instance, they would say, "Okay, research this company, and then uh, show the regulators that you researched the company." So all they would do is just go to the company's website, do a the snapshot, create a PDF attach it to the alert or, or, or the actual uh, document that would go to the government if, if the government ever looked at it, which I never even did, but, and that would be it. So that's, it's like, how was that research just to do a snapshot of, a, of you know, they, they, they were, it, it, was all, it was all for show, the whole thing. How did you, when you saw something, so something would hit your system, how would you know it was a, a nefarious group that money was being sent from or to? So a lot of times it was a blatant thing where where the entity was on the OFAC sanctions list, um, and and that's what led me to to figure out the whole the whole scheme they were doing, which I can, I can get into later. But but uh, you know, a nefarious group. I, I was doing research, and I would see they were tied to some transnational criminal organization, or or they were tied to some terrorist group, or um, you, you know. Um, it, or, or the transaction itself didn't look appropriate. For instance, there's a thing called smurfing, where like if if you're sending uh, you know all these small dollar amounts to you know a thousand people, it's like well, why are you doing that? It's just so things like that need to be escalated. And there's a thing called a SAR, which is a suspicious activity report, and that's supposed to be written anytime you see that type of suspicious activity, and that goes to the Treasury Department and the FBI. And these SARS are so critical because they supply financial intelligence to the government. But the problem is that these SARS take um, a, you know, a while to write. So the HSBC hated writing these SARS and they didn't want to write the SARS because it, 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 it prevented them from clearing as many alerts as possible, which, which we, had, we had to clear as many as, as we could. But um, I tried writing as many SARS as, as I could, but most of them were denied. So the so so the priorities of HSBC and the priorities of national security are really in direct opposition here. Yeah, because what HSBC was doing, and this is not just HSBC, but all compliance departments is, and you know, anti money laundering is that they're trying to protect the bank from the government, right? But at the same time, the compliance departments are trying to also notify the government of national security issues where the gut, where they can then find the bank as a result of, 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 of bad activity for allowing that activity to happen. So yeah, we're talking a huge conflict of interest within every single banking department within uh, all these huge bank within, within any bank, but that's why you keep seeing these huge fines come out uh, against these banks and it's never going to end. Uh, because of that conflict that you just brought up. So when you would you would see this suspicious activity, you would raise it to your supervisors, and what was their reaction generally? Uh, it, uh, I, I mean, yeah, they, 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 their number one thing that they would say to me over and over and over again was, Everett, find a way. Go back to your cubicle and and find a way. Um, and you know, to, to, to make the transaction, you know, to, to, to make it work where you can mitigate the risk enough so a re- you can prove to a regulator that the transaction was okay, even, even if it was completely not okay. So, 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 um, I got tremendous pushback. I was demoted twice. I mean, I was on the high risk alert team at one point, the targeted alert team. I, I was eventually just doing low risk alerts, just, just clicking my mouse all day long. But they didn't know I was sabotaging them in the meanwhile. Mm. But 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 it was you know um, yeah no it was tremendous pushback. And to be honest with you, when I came into the bank, I was very enthusiastic because I wanted to make a difference. 
And, and I really wanted to try to turn the department around and, and I wanted to go after the bad guys and, and, and be this, you know, uh, cool anti money laundering officer. And they just completely hit me over the head so many times. And, and, and it was so, um, uh, emotionally, de- you know, depressing to be honest with you to have, you know, to try to be doing a good job and then have these people constantly tell you that you're not. And when did you see a pattern so significant that you decided that this was something you should bring to the uh, attention of the authorities? Yeah, so I started passing information to the CIA three weeks in. So, <laughs> so it's, yeah, so, <laughs> yeah. You're barely even trained and you're already passing data to the government. Well, that was the thing was that there was, there was no training at all uh, for, for the job. And, and they just said, sit here and approve transactions. And, and that was it. But what, what happened was, was that I'll never forget the one transaction that, that really, really did it was I, there was an arms dealer or there's a shipping company out of, out of Canada. And, and I called them and I said, you know, would you allow me to try to get, you know, I have to get bullets into Iran and this and that, you know, I, I BS it. And they said, yeah, no problem, this and that. And then I needed, I, and so I was like, okay, we need to file a SAR on these guys and drop them as a client because if they're willing to, if they're getting bullets into Iran, an OFAC sanctioned country, we need to, you know, immediately get, you know, and, and my, and my supervisor read me out. She's like, don't ever make a phone call again. You can't do that type <laughs> of stuff. And, and, you know, I mean, I was just doing some CAA tactics or whatever, but, but, um, and that, and that's when I knew that that these people were um, not on the side of the U.S. government. And then there was another transaction where there were tons of t- tons of money um, going to you know a Chinese entity, and they were massing it. So it was one MSB transferring money to another MSB, which is a money servicing business. Um, and the problem is, is that an MSB has customers, right? So if you're if an MSB is transferring money to another MSB, you can't see who the real customer is. So what did the CIA do with your information? Well, I found out, uh, um, I have to be careful what, what I say on this one, but, but, but I found out later on, years later. Um, so, so, so for instance, the, the, the Tajin brothers were, were, you know, were people, some people I reported, they were running the supermarket chain out of Gambia and Sierra Leone and money was being sent to them. And, and, and what the significance of them was that they were major financiers of Hezbollah, which is, you know, again, you know, the Iranian revolutionary guard. So, um, I found out, you know, later on that, that, that my intelligence was used to kidnap one of those brothers in Mar- CIA, kidnap one of those brothers in Morocco and, and brought them to the United States to face terror charges. And I, and the Israelis, um, you know, ended up car bombing the other brother, uh, in a situation and the other ones hiding in Beirut. But I, 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 I played, you know, media exposure can really expose a lot of this stuff. And, and I know my intelligence was used in, and also what I was told by, by uh, um, a, uh, a CIA official was, you know, they didn't know the extent of, of, of how much money was being laundered and how much money was going to terrorists. And then the agency, the CIA, was able to hone in on a lot of these transactions and hunt a lot of these terrorists down, you know, because, again, you can't do anything without money being moved. Like, no person can operate without, without monetary movement. What was the effect of being a whistleblower on your personal life? Yeah, it was a devastating, um, devastating, devastating effect. I mean, I lost everything. Um, I, you know, I'm, I'll never, I mean, I ended up living in a, it was like a three or 400 square foot apartment. You know, I lost like my car, my apartment. I, mean, I lost I mean, everything. Uh, every material object I had was gone. And, you know, my desk, I ended up using as a, uh, I ended up having a plastic fold out table. And that's actually where I wrote the um, U.S. Senate um, intelligence report that HBC was sponsoring terrorism that went to U.S. Senate. It was on that plastic fold out table. And then, you know, I had a cot that I was sleeping, uh, you know, like an actual camping cot that I was sleeping on as a bed. Um, and I had all these, 
you know, like a beanie bag thing is my couch for, from Walmart. And it, it, you know, I think my whole apartment I purchased for probably a hundred dollars at Walmart, right. to be honest with you. But, 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 but from, a, from an emotional standpoint, I mean, look, I, you know, there was a point where, you know, I mean, I was working at PF Chang's, right. I mean, I, I got a job as a waiter. Uh, it's funny. I went from working at, at a Chinese bank to a Chinese restaurant, but, you know, th- I mean, but, but they ended up, you know, PF Chang saved me because they gave me lo mein and they gave, I know this is funny, but, but they gave me food and they, they, they gave me a living, a play, a, a way to make money. And I, even as an MBA making all this money at HSBC, but it was depressing because knowing that these guys back at HSBC were making 90,000 a year when I was, you know, making, you know, 215 an hour plus tips. But at least I did it with honor, you know, mm. and, and but but at the same time, I'll never forget sitting at my chair and, 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 you know, I'll never forget like when the Justice Department, you know, when 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 nothing happened and, and, and the bank w- was fine, but nobody went to jail. I mean, I was going to kill myself, to be honest with you. I mean, to be uh, it's, it's, it's a, that's a vulnerable thing to say, but. It, 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 you know, it's true. I, I felt like I lost everything. Like I, I lost justice. I lost. Um, you felt betrayed. You know, yeah. Yeah. I felt absolutely betrayed on, you know, uh, and in every aspect of my life and most of my family and, and friends bailed on me. And it was, yeah. So being a whistleblower is no joke. I mean, anyone who you know does that has real balls. Would you do it again? Yeah, without hesitation, because we could, because because it, it, it's a matter of honor, and and, and uh, it, it, you know it, it's a matter. Look, I did the right thing, and, and I'll say that out of arrogance, but I did the right thing, and 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 as a result, good things did did happen. As as not to me, not just to me, but but in, in, to, I think to the world in general. I think. Some good things had to have happened. I don't know what they are, but but all I know <laughs> is that I, I I did the right thing, and yeah, I would do it again. And and you know, uh, you have to always do the right thing, no matter what. And I think people are losing that in society today, where where they're they're too worried about losing things and 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 what people think and. No, no. It's like the world would be a better place if just if just every individual just did the next right thing. And I'm not saying I'm an angel or something or I'm some like guy that always does the right thing. But in this instance, when you're dealing with terrorists and drug cartels and these people were, were, were out to kill me afterwards, you have to understand. I mean, I put a pretty big target on my back. You, you know, it doesn't it was for the greater good. You know, I, I mean. What advice would you give somebody else out there who's thinking about taking a stand, uh, a David versus a Goliath? What would you tell them? I would, I, I, I would say it, for, for, for someone who's going to you know, do, do, do the David and Goliath, I would say one, every single person should, should be taking on some David and Goliath role in their life in, in some capacity doesn't have to be some huge one, but it has to be something. But there has to be a David and Goliath, and you have to be willing to lose it all. You can't go into a David and Goliath situation saying, you know what, I'll give a half measure, and, and, and I'm not willing to lose lose it all. Like right now, I'm willing to lose my business. I'm willing to lose my car. I, I, I just don't care. And that's where the enemy, that, that's where they have the problem because – how do you fight a guy with nothing to lose right now that not that that's the way a David and Goliath wins. And also, you know, remember David, not you have to remember David wins in the end. That's the one thing mentally a David and Goliath fighter has to remember is that they will win in the end in some capacity, in some way, shape or form. Well, ever we'll leave it there. Thank you so much for your time and keep fighting the good fight. Oh, thank you, sir. And I I, I appreciate it. Hey, everybody. If you like what we're up to here at Crazy Money, do us and yourself a favor by following the show on your favorite podcast app and subscribing to our YouTube channel. Also, click the link in the show notes to subscribe to my new Substack, where you'll get biweekly thoughts on the role of money in our world and in our lives directly to your email inbox. Thanks for sticking around. We'll see you next week.
Thank you.